My name is Lou, I'm one of the pastors here and it's uh, my great privilege today to bring us uh, the message from the Lord. Quite a while ago, I was walking down the street and I came across this really interesting building. It was very unusual. I was just walking by and I thought, yeah, you know, I think I'll go in and have a bit of a look. But there was this sign outside and it said, do not enter. And I said to myself, who are they to say that I can't go in? I mean, if I want to go in, I can go in, can't I? I can do whatever I like. Who are they to tell me that I can't go in this building? So I walk in. I go down a little bit further and there's another sign. It says, explosives. (laughs) And, you know, I realise that actually that sign was very important. The people who put that sign up actually had uh, my good health in mind. They did not want me to go in for very good reason. And so it is with the Ten Commandments. And this particular commandment that we are looking today, the Seventh Commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14. Because you see, true love does not last after others. For the very good reason, because it's for our own good. It's what's best for us. You know, faithfulness to our partner is at the very heart of good family relationships and it's what's good for our society as well. Let's pray. Father God, we just give you thanks this morning as we are able to come, Lord, before your word. Uh, Lord, help us to uh, reverence your word, uh, to take your word seriously in our lives, Lord, uh, to seek to apply it to our life, Lord, because we know that is how you made us to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you listen to these words, you shall not commit adultery. You know, they call us to this understanding that that sexual relationship is for marriage and for marriage only. That that you know, marriage is a lifelong commitment. It's for keeps. Sexual fidelity is a very key aspect of that relationship. So faithfulness is not just required in marriage, it's very much a necessity of marriage. Adultery is having sexual relations by mutual consent between a married man or woman with anyone else other than their spouse. You know, we often think about adultery as like a a line in the sand. As long as I don't go uh, over the line, I'm okay. But that's not how the Bible speaks about it. The Bible doesn't talk about a line. It talks about a condition of the heart. From which actions then flow. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18 says, Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin uh, a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Adultery is a terrible sin. But it's a sin against our own body our own body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 5, it says, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, 
an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. You see, God takes sexual sin very, very seriously. And sexual sin includes adultery. You see, infidelity is often a hidden sin, isn't it? It's a secret sin. It causes a loss of trust and it breaks up marriage relationships. But adultery isn't just having sex with another person. You know, it often starts a lot more innocently than that. Listen, I'm just helping out this uh, woman uh, at work. She's, she's having a really hard time. So I thought, oh, you know, I'd, I'd just, you know, be helping her out. Uh, I took her out for a cup of coffee. We had lunch together in this uh, um, uh, quiet little place. I confide in her instead of my wife. And an emotional relationship begins. Hey, it was just a casual kiss. Didn't really mean anything. But I think to myself, hmm, sure was better than kissing my wife. I look for intimacy where I shouldn't. See, these are all emotional adultery. And that's how all, most of all adultery begins. What does Jesus have to say about it? Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 28. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus is saying here, he deepens the meaning here, doesn't he? You shall not commit adultery. He doesn't set the law aside, does he? He moves from you know, external obedience to purity of the heart. Whoever looks at a woman in order to lust after her, if you've got lustful thoughts in your heart, if you indulge in them, it'll lead you to sexual sin. You know, what does this tell us? It says to me uh, that every married man is an adulterer. None of us are sinless people. All of us have sinned and all of us have sinned sexually. We are no better than anybody else. And that's what Jesus is telling us here. You know, when we look at this uh, marriage debate that's going on, we are not to think that we are better than other people. We are sinners just like everyone else. What we have is a way through sin. Jesus Christ. That's the important message that we need to tell other people. It's not that you're a sinner and I'm not. It's that we're both sinners. But I have found a way through sin. Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the message that we need to tell people. Now, with men, of course, men have this a problem by sinning with what they see. You know, attractive woman walks past. That's not necessarily a problem in itself. But it's the second look. An attractive woman goes past and our eye goes to her. We stare. You know, what exactly am I doing? You know, what, what's my motivation? <coughs> What am I thinking? You 
What am I doing when I have that second look? That's what we need to ask ourselves. It is a problem for men. And we need to help each other with those kinds of issues. <coughs> I remember uh, many years ago when I started in my very first job. I worked in this uh, uh, manufacturing company, had a big, uh, a big manufacturing plant, and they had something that very few companies had in those days, a really big mainframe computer. You might think it's no big deal, but in those days, it was a big deal. We had a computer. And right above where all the computer terminals were, there was this big sign. And it said, computer, junk in, junk out. Junk in, junk out. If you put junk into a computer you can only expect to get junk out of a computer. And you know, that's very much the same with us, with our minds. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, and acceptable and perfect. If we put junk into our minds, what on earth do we expect to get out? You know, what kind of movies do you watch? What part of programs, internet? You know, is it full of sex scenes, nudity? You watch Game of Thrones? and programs like that? If we're putting all of that into our minds, what do we expect to come out? What about you ladies? You like watching those uh, Korean uh, romance dramas? Twilight, perhaps? Where people in these kinds of shows, you know, it's just they just go from one sexual romance to another. If we're putting all of that into our minds, all of us, you know, whether you're single or, or married, you know, we need to be careful what we fill up our minds with. We say to ourselves, it's okay, I can watch that. I can handle it. It doesn't affect me. I just do it for entertainment. Well, that's what we say to ourselves, but it's not true. Remember, junk in, junk out. We need to keep our minds pure if we're to keep our actions pure as well. How did Jesus fulfil this seventh commandment? Now, we know that Jesus never married. We know that Jesus is the only person to have ever lived who did not sin at all, ever. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus never had sex with anyone. But Jesus never ever looked at another person with a lustful thought. Jesus never looked at another person and had a wrong thought about them. Jesus was tempted just like you and me, like, just like we're tempted. But when the temptation came to him, it was like having a, a one metre thick steel uh, door without a door handle on it. It was immovable. The temptation came, but it never got anywhere. It could never get through. That door was rock solid shut.
But what can we do if we have committed adultery or other sexual sin? What do you do, you know, if you struggle with, with lustful thoughts? 1 John 1 9 it tells us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to come to God. We need to confess our sins before the Lord. And then we need to turn 180 degrees away. We need to repent from our sin. It means turn away from sin. When David sinned with Bathsheba, he said to God in Psalm 51.4, Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. We need to come to God. And we need to ask for his forgiveness. We need to repent and turn away from our sin. But what I want to say is, you know, don't use God's amazing grace as an excuse for your sin. Don't say to yourself, listen, I'll sin and God will forgive me anyway, so it'll be okay. You know, God's grace is amazing, but it's not cheap grace. It's not cheap grace. If we're married, we need to talk with our spouse. I know this is not an easy area, especially if we've committed adultery but we need to be able to tell our partner about this. You know, without trust, no marriage can ever last. You know, secrets do not make for intimacy in marriage. We need to ask for their forgiveness. We need to tell them that we are sorry for what we have done. And we will turn away from what we've done. And we need to seek help as well. You know, you might need to uh, go to a, a marriage counsellor. You might need to go to someone who can give you particular help, perhaps about an addiction or some other issue that you're facing with. You know, I want to say to married couples, you know, get help early. Don't leave it and think it'll just get better by itself. Don't wait until it's too late. And, and you might want to get a mentor or a discipler to help you as well. Someone who can keep you accountable, who can help you with, with boundaries and, and accountability. Uh, you know, we can do that for each other, can't we? You know, why... Why is sexual sin, why is sexual infidelity so destructive to marriage? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 13 tells us, sorry, verse 16. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it's written, the two will become one flesh. See, when you have sex with another person, you become, that's what this verse says, you become one body with them. A connection happens. You know, sex creates this oneness. Scientific studies have shown that there are bonding hormones that are released uh, when people have sexual relations. In uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Hold fast. It means to cleave onto, hang onto. It means being stuck together with glue so that you can't be unstuck very easily. 
you can't have sex with another person and break up with them and not leave part of yourself behind. Today, you know, sex is treated like a commodity. It's just something that we do. We pay a price for. We get it. And then we go on. You know, it's just treated like um, a physical thing. We just do it for physical pleasure and that's it. But sex is a very important part of marriage. It connects two people together. You know, not just physically, but emotionally and, and spiritually as well. Sex builds closeness. Sex builds intimacy. It builds partnership between two people. You know, it defines this relationship as being very different from all other relationships that I have. Sex is a powerful tie that, that glues us together as two people. But when people have sex before marriage, you know, to, to protect yourself, to protect yourself against pain and hurt and giving your heart to somebody who's not going to be there in the morning, we tend to disconnect sex from building a strong, intimate relationship. We learn to stop giving ourselves emotionally to that person that we're having sex with. And then when we do get married, because we've learned to distance sex from you know, emotional intimacy, when we do get married you may not be able to bring the two back together again. There's a real danger that sex in marriage won't be able to do what it's designed to do. Tim Keller put it this way. He said, sex outside of marriage eventually works backwards, making you less able to commit and trust one another. What about couples who um, live together before marriage? You know, stats show again and again that couples who cohabitate before marriage have a worse outcome in terms of marriage. Uh, they're less satisfied with their marriages and they're more likely to divorce than other couples are. In fact, they're twice as likely to divorce than couples who did not cohabitate before marriage. A Christian friend of mine, he got married in his early 20s. Um, uh, when he got to about his 30s, he had this younger brother. Um, he was married, he had kids. Uh, the younger brother, he was a very tall, uh, very handsome young man, uh, very popular with the ladies. And uh, he always had a girlfriend. And he just moved from one girlfriend to another girlfriend. And he would always boast to us about his uh, sexual relationships that he would have with his girlfriends. But after a number of years of this, one day he said to his brother, you know, I wish I had what you have. I wish I had what you have. I wish I had a girl who I was committed to and who was committed to me. I wish I had a girl that I could come home to at night, that we could have a family together. I want to have somebody who I can always love and will always love me. I'm tired of the playboy lifestyle I want to have what you have. You know, our society tells us that people aren't made to have one exclusive relationship for life. But I don't believe that. I believe that the Bible tells us 
And human experience tells us that we are made to have one exclusive relationship for life. Now, this seventh commandment, it holds a very high view of marriage. God instituted marriage in uh, Genesis chapter 2 and Jesus affirms it in Matthew chapter 19 that we read uh, this morning. And what you notice here is that marriage is given by God at creation. Marriage isn't just for Christians. It's for everybody. God made marriage for all human beings. Jesus said, What God has joined together, let not man separate, in Matthew 19.6. You mess with God when you mess with marriage. You mess with God when you mess with marriage. And of course, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 how you know this faithfulness in marriage is just a reflection of the faithfulness that God has shown to us, as God has shown to the church. It's a reflection of the relationship between Christ and the church. Our faithfulness in our marriage is a reflection of God's faithfulness to us. Uh, For those of you who uh, are married or are thinking of getting married or even if you're thinking of getting married in the not-too-distant future, I'd like to recommend this book. It's uh, by Tim Keller, The Meaning of Marriage. Uh, It's also co-authored with him by his wife, Kathy. Uh, It's a great book to read and understand about biblical marriage. So if you need to know about biblical marriage, this would be a great book. There are other books as well, of course, but this is just one that I would recommend to you. You can get it off uh, uh, Book Depository. It's a great place to uh, quickly get hold of books. That's where I buy them anyway. How do you remain faithful as a single person or as a married person? Don't sleep with your boyfriend or girlfriend. Be accountable. You might want to put accountability software on your telephone, on your computer, and uh, give access to it to perhaps a mentor. You know, married couples, you need to be accountable to each other. Single people, you might need to find someone Uh, Perhaps it could be your mentor, but find someone of the same sex who you can be accountable to. No one gets victory over sexual sin on their own. And you know, when you stuff up, remember, run to God. 1 John 1 9, confessing your sins. When we sin, don't run away from God. Run towards God. Now, I've been married to Gail for uh, almost 32 years. And I just want to mention uh, a few things here that I feel have helped us uh, in our marriage together. First of all, know what you believe. Know what you believe. We believe that adultery is wrong. And you might think that's no big deal. But actually it is. See, I've uh, been involved with a lot of people who have gotten married. And so often I hear people say something like, I just hope the marriage will work. Know what you believe. If you really believe that adultery is wrong, then that's how you're going to live. If you believe that adultery is okay then that's how you will live. If you don't know whether adultery is okay or not, then it just depends on the circumstances, what might happen at the time. I don't know what I'll do. That's what you're saying to yourself. It's important to know what you believe. 
and then to live by that. Um, Secondly, before we got married, we made a decision together and we made the decision that divorce would not be an option for us. Divorce would not be an option for us. No matter what happens, we would not get divorced. I might kill her, but I won't divorce her. (laughs) Now, please don't take me seriously. I'm just joking. But I would like to mention, if I happen to die by some accident, please make sure it's thoroughly investigated by the police, just to make sure. (laughs) You know, when you seriously make a decision like that, it's got implications. It's got implications about how you live your marriage. You see, when an issue comes up between the two of us, we have to deal with it. We can't let it go. We can't leave it. If a problem happens, it's got to be resolved between us because we've already made that kind of decision. We can't let things build up that causes a problem between the two of us because of the commitment that we have already made. If you're already married, maybe you'd like to think about making that kind of commitment with each other. That no matter what, divorce will not be an option for you. Thirdly, uh, boundaries in marriage. Uh, Boundaries in marriage are very important. Uh, So if I find that I'm attracted to another person, another woman, My boundary tells me I will have nothing to do with that person. I don't go near that person. I don't work with that person. I get away from that person because I don't trust myself. Remember Joseph who ran away from Potiphar's wife in uh, Genesis chapter 39. See, when sin comes looking for you, you run. I remember a story about a, a, a friend that told me about uh, a friend of his. Uh, he worked in this particular company, had a great job. Uh, there was this woman there and uh, she was having a hard time. Uh, in fact, uh, her and her husband were going through the process of divorce. And this guy noted that this woman seemed to be getting attached to him. She wanted to meet up with him. She wanted to share things with him. And he could see this coming along. And you know what he did? He left his job. He left his job. He said to himself, I don't want to take any chances. I'm not taking any risks about my relationship with my wife. This woman seems to be coming after me. I'm leaving. He left his job. Another boundary for me is that I don't see women. Uh, um, uh, I don't see women alone, uh, women that I don't. Uh, I'm not related to. I should say. Uh, so when I meet up with uh, people at church, if it's uh, uh, just with a woman by herself, if it's during the day, it's generally okay because there's other people around. Uh, but if it's in the evening, uh, if it's a couple or um, a guy, I'm happy to meet up with them in the office. But if it's not, what I do is I go to a coffee shop. I'd never meet in the office with a woman alone in the evening. I always take her to a coffee shop and meet and talk. There's plenty of other people around. I go to Melbourne Central and the, you know, I make sure I'm not alone with a woman that I'm not related to. I guard my thought life. I'm accountable to my wife for my thought life. I'm accountable to my mentors that I've had over the years as well. I only want to have positive thoughts about other people. And I need help to do that. Number five, we've chosen to live in a Christian community. We've brought up our family here at Cross Culture. And you know what that does? It encourages us in our marriage. 
In a church uh, community, you get teaching about marriage, you get teaching against adultery. Uh, when, you know, people who are close to us, uh, that they might see something in our relationship, they've got the freedom to tell us. Because, you know, they're concerned for us. You know, if we have problems, then people are going to encourage us to, to work through those problems. They're going to encourage us to stay in the marriage, to be reconciled with one another, to, you know, work hard at making our marriage work. We need to be in a community that encourages us to do that. Not in one that's going to do the opposite. And lastly, we, uh, we need to find ways to keep our marriage fresh. To do things together, you know, lo- write love notes to one another. That's what some people do. Um, have regular date nights. Uh, weekends away, go away on holidays together. You know, we need to, listen guys, you need to keep pursuing your wife in marriage. You've got to keep pursuing her like you did before you got married. Let her know that you love her and you will find your own ways of doing that. Routinely break the routine. You know, do something different. Do something unexpected. I remember one time uh, I took Al out. I said, you know, we're go- going to go to this restaurant. I took it to this very tacky, very uh, cheap place. Uh, but actually what I had planned and already bought tickets for a live show and uh, eventually I, uh, without her knowing, got her into this live show and we had a great night. So that was, you know, a bit of a surprise, something unexpected. Um, a few years back, I just, you know, sort of whim of the moment, I just t- decided to buy her an eternity ring. And it's still one of her favourite rings after the engagement ring. (laughs) You know, find shared hobbies to do together. Uh, If you're buying the ring, by the way, gentlemen, it needs to be very expensive. (laughs) The more expensive, uh, then uh, uh, the greater surprise it'll be. (laughs) Uh, But there are different seasons in life as we go through life together. And you'll find different things that we need to keep doing together as we go through different seasons of life together. Well, let's come together and pray. And uh, I want to lead us in a prayer of confession. A prayer of confession to Jesus. If there is something, if there is a sin in your life that you want to bring before Jesus now, uh, let's do that together. Lord God, we want to acknowledge our sin before you. You know my sin. Against you, you only have I sinned, Lord, and done what is evil in your sight. My sin is always before you. You delight in the truth, Lord. Help me to be truthful about my sin to those I need to be truthful with. Have mercy on me, O Lord, according to your steadfast love, according to your incredible mercy. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Help me today, my Lord, to turn away from my sin. I know the blood of Jesus has cleansed me. May I today, in the power of the Holy Spirit, turn away from my sin and turn to you only. Help me to repent and to live in the light of the love of Jesus for me. I turn constantly to you, my Lord. My dependency is on you alone. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.